it's, it's quite a feat to see all of the engineering and all of the technology that goes into all these huge tools that we're using to illuminate the smallest structures. Since the beginning of time, man has wondered three questions. One, what's up there? Two, what's down here? And three, why are we here? Well, I'm here at CLASS, the Cornell Laboratory for Accelerator-Based Science and Education. My name's Jonathan Chen. I'm an intern here, and I'm ready to find out exactly what the scientists are doing to pursue those questions. So there's, a, there's so much to, to learn, and x-rays are just right there. It's really fantastic. <laughs> you know that this is on the campus of Cornell University, and so a lot of what we do is um, education based. A lot of students come to you know, grade school, bring students along, hopefully just keeping them interested in science until yeah. they can start um, pursuing a PhD in physics, which is the best field to go into. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm not a biased person. Not I'm, not what, I'm a very open-minded person. No, so the reason we're here is, like I, I was mentioning, um, in the 60s and 70s, they started doing particle physics and they produced x-rays. We shoot x-rays at various samples that are protein samples, crystallography, uh, that sort of thing. We're in the middle of what's called a chess run period. So chess is the Cornell High Energy Supertron source. There are actually a lot of applications of accelerator physics. They're studying uh, nuclear physics. So they're studying what goes on inside the nucleus of atoms. And in order to do that, they have to scatter something off of the nucleus. And they want to scatter very, very high energy light off of it. And so basically, just a transport pipe, x-rays come out, scatter, get it detected by a detector. And the detector is an imaging detector, very similar to your camera here only a uh, higher sensitivity, and it's sensitive to x-rays instead of visible light. And so what we do is uh, we basically make an image of the diffraction pattern in two dimensions, and then we can analyze multiple images to determine the crystal quality. We operate in two different modes here that are very complementary. Uh, the first half is what we're operating in right now, the, the x-ray light source operations. And that's the most straightforward to see the applications of. People coming in and doing anything ranging from protein crystallography and determining protein structures for medical developments. We have people coming in and doing uh, aerospace engineering, looking at things like crack propagation and different kinds of material strains and things like that. We, have, we even have um, art history. We can x -ray, uh, use an x-ray beam to see if there's another image behind the first layer of paint on a painting and if, you know, to see if somebody painted over it or filled in the painting. So what we designed was uh, we put the x-ray detector behind this polycapillary and the polycapillary only accepts x-rays that are coming in that blue area. So where those two overlap is where you will sense the fluorescence. So this is a painting that was a, a black and white illustration that was lost. No one knew where it was. It turned out it was underneath that painting. The artist reused the canvas. Right, the spin-offs you never know about, right? So they can say the internet was World Wide Web. You know, that was born out of the necessity for physicists to share information with collaborators from all over the world with one another. So that's great. I mean, there's a tangible, there's a takeaway. We see, oh, well, there's a reason within itself. So that's definitely one, you know, and as they grapple with problems relating to, you know, big data, I think that, you know, we can see an application for all of the research being done in particle physics. It's extremely complicated. The detector is complicated. There are millions of channels. can't believe it came together like that, right? So all these people talk to each other and, you know, got the specs to work with each other and then put it together and communicate it with the technicians and the engineers and that this whole huge operation came together to produce this incredible precision, you know, a very sophisticated, highly tuned piece of physics that it just is to me just a miracle. It always kind of came back to science and what is it about, what do I want to do with my life? And I always, I always wanted to teach and it was just natural that I'd want to teach science. So and I don't think there was one defining moment, but I know that my upbringing certainly had something to do with it. 
I would say that it was there from the beginning. The curiosity was there from the beginning. In fact, largely because I was driven by curiosity and when I wasn't curious about something, it was really hard to get me interested. Where I think I have an edge is that I still think like a kid. So when kids come in here and it's their first time uh, seeing some phenomena, that sort of experience to me is like um, watching your favorite movie again, but with somebody you love. I do find it interesting that a lot of kids lose that sense of wonder and amazement at the natural world around them. And I think part of the trouble is that parents oftentimes don't encourage their children to continue to ask these questions. You know, it's natural for a while when you're a kid, you want to know, oh, well, what's that? How does that work? But after a while, this cynicism sort of sets in around, you know, teenager age or so. And trying to find a way to communicate with kids such that they don't lose that sense of wonder and amazement about their natural world around them uh, is absolutely critical.